Uh, well, I had dated and, you know, I kind of knew that I wasn't going to marry, you know, whoever it was that I was dating, you know, more or less at the beginning. I knew right away and, um, you know, I broke hearts and, you know, it don't feel good. It don't. And uh, so I decided to work on myself because I realized to get the perfect woman, you got to be the perfect man. And I just kind of went on a, you know, path to better myself. You know, I already ate really good. I didn't eat fast food. I don't eat packaged food, canned food. Um, yes, on today's luxury comfort cart, there are some apple cinnamon cookie thingies and some chocolate pumpkin. You're welcome, cookie thingies. <laughs> Same disclaimer, I didn't bake them. I can't tell you what the ingredients are, okay? I don't know what people's conditions are. That's why they're in their little separate containers. You're more than welcome to help yourselves if you wish. At your own risk. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. So happy Friday. And at this juncture, I do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, we're outside the presence of the jury in case 831543. Councilors, just so we get, um, would you mind doing your appearances again, please? Of, of course, Your Honor. Teddy Parker, Will Kemp, and Eric Peppermint on behalf of the plaintiffs. And we have with us Mr. M. Watson, Ms. Brody, Ms. Schaefer, and Ms. Sosa. Thanks so much. I'll be having real water, please. Good morning, Your Honor. Joel Adieu, Mark Love, uh, Eric Freeman, and Matt Kaufman on behalf of the Real Water Defendants. Okay. And anyone remotely that anyone needs to introduce, or is that just all observers? I think just observers. <laughs> okay. okay. Just if you want to make sure if anybody needs to. Hey, Mr. Parker, you're standing. I think you wanted to address some exhibit issues, and then maybe somebody else wants to address the stipulation. Yes, Your Honor. Thanks so much. Mr. Godfrey provided the redacted version of Exhibit 61 and 65. I could present this to the court clerk. Sure. Thanks. Um, Council for Real Water, you had a chance to review them? We did, Your Honor. Thank okay. you. So court's understanding is that's the 61 and 65 that, is to re that are going to be in paper copy that will go back to the jury instead of the electronic version, which was the original version. Is that correct, Council? That is, for correct. is that correct, Council for Real Water? Yes, it is, Your Honor. Thank you so very much. Look, you can get a pre Of course. Nice teal little envelope, too. You're taken care of. Okay. Thank you. And we're now going to Mr. Pepperman and Mr. Kaufman for a stipulation. Yes, Your Honor. Please. Okay, so who's speaking? Go ahead. Um, Your Honor, Matt Kaufman on behalf of Real Water. Uh, Mr. Pepperman and I have reached a stipulation as to Miles Hunwardson's future medical costs. Um, the stipulation is okay. for $900,000. For future you medical You want that on the record? Do you understand we're on the record fully? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. It's just a stipulated fact as to the what the future medical costs will be, and that will eliminate the need for the jury to, to determine those damages. So we would handle that in the jury instruction by saying we've stipulated to the future medicals at X amount, and so you don't need to determine that or, or award damages. Those have already been agreed to. And that will alleviate the need for uh, the life care planner uh, to testify so it, it saves time. Yeah. Is that Kennington? Yes, that is Melissa Kennington, Your Honor. Okay, so then she's not going to testify. Okay, no worries. Any other, and is that on the record under EDCR 7.50, whether you're going to memorialize it in writing through a jury instruction or something else, but at this juncture, EDCR 7.50 or not? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Eric Pepperman for plaintiffs. It, it's a stipulation under EDCR 7.50. Also for real water? Matthew Coffin for real water. We stipulate as well, Your Honor. Okay. Any other matters outside the presence? Other son, other Marshall, we have the jury ready. Is that correct? Any other matters before the jury comes in? Uh, that is it, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. O'Doul and I have spoken about concerns we have with Ms. Sosa's testimony to make sure uh, this should go pretty quickly without any objections. But I just wanted to let the court know that we've, we've had that discussion outside the presence of okay. the witness as well. As Okay, I appreciate it. The court will address anything as it comes up. Marshall, feel free to bring in our jury. Thank you so much. Everyone, that was fun. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Of course, of course. Okay. I mean, if you want to do it now, later, whenever you want. Thank you. As you know, I mentioned to the jury that people are coming in and out, so that not just taking notice of that. Yes, those are for you all. I was just going to give my disclaimer before I mentioned was today's items on the comfort car to our. <laughs> Marshall, will you be seated?
Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Okay. So welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully you had a nice relaxing evening. Hoping the rain didn't interfere too much with whatever you were planning on doing. Um, yes, on today's little jury comfort cart, there are some apple cinnamon cookie thingies and some chocolate pumpkin. You're welcome, cookie thingies. <laughs> Same disclaimer. I didn't bake them. I can't tell you what the ingredients are. Okay. I don't know what people's conditions are. That's why they're in their little separate containers. You're more than welcome to help yourselves if you wish. At your own risk. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. So happy Friday. And at this juncture, um, I'm going to ask counsel for plaintiff to please call their next witness. Counsel, would you like to call your next witness? I would, Your Honor. I'd like to call Ms. Christina Sosa, please. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under pain and penalty of perjury. Thank you. We have a seat. Please state and spell your name for the record. Christina Sosa, C H R I S T I N A S O S A. Oh, Council, I was just going to give my couple of quick, oh, right. you've heard me say this to other witnesses. I think you're already anticipating it because you put the microphone closer to you, you're leaning forward, perfect. They find the same things about, you know, audible answers. Sometimes when people move to stand, or just mentions that. And the other thing is sometimes it gets a little conversational. We just need to make sure only one person is talking at a time. Okay? Yes. Appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Council, feel free to proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Ms. Sosa. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we won't be very long. I'll just say that up front. I get teased sometimes. Ms. Uh, <laughs> Sosa, I'm going to have you introduce yourself to the jury, and I want to start off with where you were born. My name's Christina. I was born and raised in Newport, New Hampshire. And where did you go to school? Uh, Newport High School, home of the Tigers. Um, and yes. then after high school? After high school, I went to Bryant College. It's in Smithfield, Rhode Island. Now, you played sports in high school as well as in college? I did. Um, in high school, I played field hockey, basketball, uh, softball, and in college, I played two years of softball. What position did you play in basketball? Um, I was a forward. Do you go watch the Aces play? I haven't yet, but I want to, yes. Now, you graduated from what college again? It's Bryant College. I think it's now Bryant University. Was that in 1994? It was in 94, yes. And after that, what did you do in terms uh, of any further education? Further education? No. Did you begin working after 1994? Yes. Um, I, my first job was right outside of Boston. I was there for about a year. Um, then I moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I was hired as an accountant there, and um, that is where I met my husband, and um, I worked there for two years. All right. And what line of work have you primarily worked in? Accounting. And is that what you're doing today? Yes. Do you work for a company today, or do you work for your own place? I have my own small business. Okay. And how long have you had this business? Um, I think it was around... Uh, 2013, so about 11 years. And before that, did you work, do accounting work for other businesses? Yes. And what are your hobbies? Uh, my hobbies, I still play softball mm -hmm. in a senior league. Senior league? Yeah. Um, we play in a league and in tournaments. And then um, I like to golf. I like to ski, scuba dive. Um, but most of the time, I just hang at home. I like to cook, garden, putter around the house, organize things. Um, you've given up basketball, huh? Yes. You just got a coach here. I'm just saying, just in case you need some. Oh time. no, those days are over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to. I'm trying to calm you down. Ms. Yes. I, I know you're nervous. So, Miss Miss Sosa, let's kind of talk about why we're here, okay? Okay. Um, if you could, Jane, can you put up slide 42? <clears throat> and this may be a quicker way, Ms. Sosa, of kind of going through your your experience with real water. Okay. 42, you said? 42 of my uh, open. I believe it was my open. It could be 42 of my director, Dr. Hudson. 
In fact, I'll give it to you so you can see. So, on the screen, uh, Ms. Sosa, are all the plaintiffs in this case. You recognize them all, correct? Yes. And you've heard through this uh, trial, of course, already testimony from Ms. Brody, Ms. Schaefer, and Ms. Hartshorn, correct? That's correct. And you've heard their symptoms? Yes. Did you have similar symptoms to these plaintiffs? I did. All right. And <clears throat> it's my understanding that prior to being admitted to the hospital on November 3rd, 2020, you've been suffering from similar symptoms going back to mid-2020. That's correct. Could you describe to the uh, jury what symptoms you were suffering from? Sure. Um, probably mid-2020, uh, um, I was uh, very tired, um, dizzy, and I was starting to um, lose, I had less focus and concentration. And were you drinking real water at that time? I was. I've been drinking real water since July of 2018. Okay. And were you getting it by home delivery? Yes, I started the home delivery. It was in February of 2019, the five gallon jugs. Were you also drinking bottles or was it just the home delivery uh, five jug containers? I started drinking the, um, the, uh, the liter the liter jugs, um, the liter uh, bottles, liter bottles um, in July of 2018, and then um, the home delivery started in like February of 2019. Okay, and so your symptoms that started in mid 2020 did they continue to uh, become more severe? They did. Can you describe how uh, they became more severe? So it was probably late September, early October, um, the symptoms started to get worse and my, um, the, the dizziness kind of turned into more of an off balance and, um, and I started to get more foggy headed. Um, and then uh, a few days before, like the end of October um, is when, I, uh, my, off, my off balance was so bad that I would be walking into the, the walls and just wobbling around and very like, um, almost like a tunnel vision and very f foggy. And um, then it progressed to where I had this twitch in my um, right hand that would come and go and probably about three days before I went to ER the first time. Um, I was like, if I had a cup or a plate or a glass or a plate or something, I actually ended up smashing on the floor. I had to clean up. I remember at least two or three, maybe more, more times than that, that I would drop the, uh, the dishes and I'd smash all over the place. Yes, ma'am. Now, it's my understanding that sometime in mid-October, a friend of yours, Penny, came to visit? That's correct. All right. And uh, while she stayed with you, uh, was she also drinking real water? She was. Uh, was Penny, did Penny leave before you went into the hospital on November 3rd? Yes. Uh, while she was there, did you notice her sleeping uh, uh, changing, her sleep habits changing? Yes. She drinks a ton of water like I do, like over a gallon a day. And she, um, she uh, was there probably it was probably day two or three. She was going to stay a week. Um, and then she, yeah, she complained of being dizzy and wobbly and she was nauseous. And then, um, yeah, she was just sleeping like 16 to 20 hours a day where my son even made a comment, you know, well, is she sleeping again? You know, kind of thing. And let, let's talk, let's stop for a second and talk about your, your household. Yes. So, other than Penny coming to visit, who else lives in the house with you? Um, my son. And that's Alex. Alex. All right. And he's 16. All right. Now, do you recall who took you to the hospital uh, on November 3rd? Uh, yes, that was um, 
So Alex had the day off of school and he was with his dad that night before. I was going to go pick him up that morning uh, on November 3rd. Um, and who brought me to the hospital was, well, they came in in the afternoon because I was supposed to pick him up and I was a no show because I had passed out. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that now, but. No, no, you can say that. I'm. <laughs> you, you can lead right into it. Uh, we're, what we're trying to do, like the judge said, we try to avoid narratives. So we, it's better if I ask a question, you respond as right. opposed to uh, going on, you know, perhaps in, in other directions. So, okay. we, so can, we can address that. So Alex typically lives with you, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we split custody. Um, uh, me and my ex, Dave. Uh, Dave, yes. Got it. And so, but on this particular day, he was with, Dave, mm -hmm. his father, yes. your ex-husband. All right. And prior to uh, November 3rd, your intention was to pick Alex up from Dave's home. Yes, after he would wake up. So I was going to run some errands before. All right. And did you run errands before your uh, intended time to pick Alex up? Yes. So I went um, grocery shopping at Smith's. And um, <clears throat> what I remember is um, like flashes, so I don't have all my memory back, but flashes of light where um, I had actually, I was driving down Green Valley and I was doing U-turns on Green Valley. And then I found out later that I actually went to Walgreens as well. Well, let's stop there. So that's, okay. that's so the jury can understand because right now, they're waiting for you to go pick up Alex and trying to figure out what your intentions were after doing your running your ear. Right. So yes. eventually, uh, Dave and Alex came to your home because you failed to pick Alex up on time. Correct? That's correct. All right. What did you find out at, once uh, you were in the hospital? Because apparently Dave well, took you to the hospital. Dave, yes. Dave and Alex came um, to the house, found me passed out with the grocery bags all over the place. Um, and um, when I woke up, when they woke me up, he was like, what's going on? And I was like, I, I don't know. Like, and I told him what, hit, what I remembered happening and I was slurring my words and I wasn't making any sense and I was repeating myself. And um, he, he was so concerned. He thought maybe I had a stroke or something. So. Uh, he's like, we need to go to the ER. And so uh, Dave uh, and Alex brought me to the ER. All right, there we have it. So if you could, uh, Shane, can you put up slide 44, please? And Your Honor, this is slide 44 is exhibit, which has been admitted already, 635, uh, and we're looking at page 9, which we've shown the, the jury before during Dr. Hudson's testimony. Yes, we show it's in it. Go ahead. Thank you. And so when you present it to the, that's page 10, is it? I want to go to page 9. There we go. Thank you. This one for the record is appropriate to exhibit 634. 634. Thank you. Yeah, that also was admitted. Feel free to proceed. Yeah, thank you. So, apparently, your ALT and AST scores were taken at the hospital on November 3rd. Do you recall that recollection? Yes. Do you have that recollection? And you went to St. Rose Dominican Hospital? Yes. And that's the side of town you live on? Yes. Okay. When you got to the hospital, did, uh, did you have any understanding of going to Walgreens in addition to going to the grocery store? No, I did not. And I then figure out that you went to Walgreens. Well, the bags were there was bags from my trunk all the way to, you know, in the house just dropped everywhere. And then I saw that I had Walgreens bags in there as well. And then later I actually looked at my credit card to see what I 
all, you know, what the cost was that I purchased while I was in this altered state. Um, and then I also reviewed my cameras and I saw that when I pulled up to the house, I had actually hit my garage door with my car. Um, and so that had happened as well. And then I must have passed out, blacked out. Okay. So did your, um, did Dave and Alex stay with you at the hospital? Or did you have your sister come? What, what happened then? Yes. Um, I, I, I think Dave called my sister and, uh, so she came and then, um, so they could, so they could leave. Cause I really didn't want my son there. With this me. is also in the middle of COVID. It's right in the middle of COVID, yes. And at that point, did you have a vertigo? Did you have any diagnosable condition that you can recall? So in this altered state, while I'm trying to um, describe my symptoms to um, the doctor or to the, the, the people that, you know, the intake people at the hospital, I'm describing, you know, the, the off balance and then this, uh, this narrowing and then the vision, the, the fogginess and all of this. And um, I said, I thought I had vertigo. Um, that's what, that's what I had told them. <clears throat> and after they ran tests, were you ultimately discharged later that day? Yeah, they took, yeah, they did some blood work and then they took some scans of the brain. Okay. And then you were released to go home. Yes. After you were released to go home, um, <clears throat> did, were you prescribing any medication? Was there anything that they asked you to do to, uh, to figure out what was going on with you? Um, so they released, and in, I guess in the medical um, notes or whatever, I think my sister had them. Uh, said that I needed to um, schedule with the uh, neurologist is what they wanted me to start with. All right. Were you also asked to see an ENT doctor? Here I was there. not, but that I, I, so what had happened was um, I, I was trying to make appointments with a neurologist and I thought of the ENT and she was able to see me right away. So I went to the ENT like uh, probably two, a couple, two or three days later. I could get in there pretty quick. Okay. Did you ultimately see an ENT and a neurologist? I did. Were they able to tell you what was going on with you, what was causing these problems? No. When I went into the ENT, so by this time, Crystal was, my best friend Crystal had moved into my house to take care of me, to help me function because I couldn't drive. I couldn't research. Uh, well, I was trying to research, like, I already knew the ENT doctor, but the neurologist and the insurance type of things, what was in my plan and all that stuff. So um, <clears throat> Crystal had taken me to the ENT, but she had to wait in the waiting room. Um, so I'm all messed up in the uh, doctor's office and trying to explain, you know, what my symptoms were and so she's, you know, asking me questions and then she actually went out when we went back out to uh, the desk there, she went out to the waiting room and she asked Crystal, uh, she's like, what is wrong with her? Is she drunk? And Crystal's like, no, she's not drunk, but and that's what we're trying to figure out because I was just so messed up. So, so let's try to put everything in, into perspective uh, chronologically, okay? So November 3rd, you go to the hospital, the ER. Eventually you're released on November 3rd. After you're released, you and your best friend, Crystal, try to find a neurologist for you to go see, is that correct? And the ENT, yes. Right, but you knew of an ENT. At least. Yes. Right. Yes. So then ultimately you go see an ENT and you see a neurologist, correct? Um, that part, yes. Okay, and based upon your examinations with the ENT and with the neurologist, they didn't have an answer for why you, why you were suffering these symptoms, correct? No, they did not. Okay. Now, between November 3rd and November 9th, when you go back to the hospital, did your symptoms continue to, to worsen? They did. They, they worsened. Um, I was getting more, um, 
confused and repeating myself and like trying to write. Um, you know, I still have some notes in my handwriting and things were backwards. And um, so that definitely was um, something that worsened. Um, another thing that had worsened is I was actually getting, um, I had this stuff coming out of my ears um, that was like a rusty colored, I don't know what you call it, just kind of like a liquid or wax or whatever, and my urine was the same color. And so you're going through you know, the, these symptoms that are becoming more severe. Mm -hmm. uh, From the reminder. Yes. Yeah, audible answer. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> and so, Christina, your best friend, does she indicate to you that you need to go back to the hospital? Do you decide you need to go back to the hospital? What led you back to the hospital on November 9th? So, Crystal had been at my house about five days by this time. It was on a Sunday, and she had said to me, that Christina, you need to get out of your house. There's something in your house that is affecting me because now she's feeling off balance. She's feeling um, nauseous and tired. These same initial symptoms that I was that I was feeling. Yeah. At that point, I had I'm listening to her, and then. I remembered Penny being sick at my house. I called Penny up and asked her her opinion, told her the theory, okay, hold on, asked hold on. her the opinion. Hold on a second. I, wanna, I don't want to go too far ahead. Okay. I want to take this in, in small pieces. Okay. So I want to go back to your symptoms at first. Okay. So before you go back to the hospital on the 9th, your symptoms are getting worse. Yes. Right? Got it. Um, was... Uh, Crystal also drinking your water, the real water. She was. Okay, let's stop there for a second. Can we look at now uh, slide 45, please? This is exhibit 636, 635, I'm sorry, page 10, I believe. Yeah. Okay, 635 was previously admitted. I was the bottom of the And so you're admitted on November 9th. And it says you were discharged the following day. Uh, at this point, your chief complaint is anxiety, nervous, says you've been dizzy or suffering dizziness and nauseous. Uh, was this the first time you started suffering from nausea? No, actually that, um, so before I went to ER, at the same time my hand was shaking um, before, um, uh, like the end of October, when all of those symptoms really worsened, um, I was I was throwing up, and I probably threw up I think three or four times. So it was like once a day in the afternoon I would just throw up. Right. And so you're thinking at this point there's some kind of toxic gas in the house, and you had a home inspection today, no results until Friday. Okay, well you're you skipped a day. I may have. I'm just going off what's <laughs> I'm going off what's on the medical records at this point. I could have skipped the day. But so that's what it says here. Do you recall telling the uh, either the nurse or perhaps a doctor or a doctor's assistant at the uh, ER that you had a home inspection done and you just were you had been uh, you were waiting for the results to come in? Yes. So what had happened was on that Sunday. Um, Crystal had said that she thought there was something in my house. Um, I confirmed it with Penny. Penny agreed with the theory. Okay. Um, then at that point, I moved out of the house to my neighbors, uh, who is a friend of mine. Um, and at that point, the then, yeah. yeah, that was on the 8th. And then this anxiety of just pure panic came over me because I knew that something was poisoning me in the house. 
because there's these other people that are being affected as well. Okay. So let me, let's get back to the question for one second. Okay. Do you recall having a home inspection done before you went back to the hospital on the night? What had happened was we had started the process. Crystal went out to immediately, got the carbon monoxide um, uh, detectors. Um, we called Southwest Gas. He came over and then she did, and I, it, might, it must have been that day or whatever, because um, she's a real estate agent, so she has people that do home inspections and things like this. So one of her contacts came over, and I wasn't there, but she kind of directed it because I was all messed up. Um, she uh, had the, the guy come over and do some testing for um, mold, but it wasn't the, the other home inspection Got that I had later. Okay. Okay. And we'll, we'll get there. All right. And then it says, under history of present illness, 48-year-old female presents to the emergency room department with symptoms of being anxious, nervous, nauseous, and dizziness, which, you know, repeats on what is above. Patient believes she is living in a home that is releasing toxic gas and is poisoning her. Patient states she, is seen, she was seen in the, uh, the emergency room department on November 3rd for dizziness, twitching of the right hand, and generalized fatigue. Were those the symptoms you were suffering when you presented on November 9th? Some of them, yes. Any other symptoms that we haven't already touched upon that you were suffering from that you can recall? I think I've, we've mentioned them. Okay, yes. good. So, you're released on the 10th. Again, were you at that point informed of what was causing your, your problems? Your injuries or your illness, I should say? No, so when I went in there, they had asked me if they, I thought I was having any anxiety. I said, yeah, I think I am because there's something poisoning me in the house. Yeah. And I was begging the, the doctors to test me for poisons. And did they direct you to your primary care physician for that or for some other type of doctor? To do yes, it? they, so they directed me to my primary care physician to refer me to a toxicologist or whoever does these sort of tests. And um, then they also um, referred me to a psychiatrist and a neurologist. Okay. So you get released on the 10th. And did you remain outside of your home while all of these testings were being performed? That's correct, yes. How long did you stay outside of your home? I was um, out of there for three months. I lived with my, uh, my, friend, my neighbor who was my friend. And Alex, your son, was he able to live with you at your neighbor? He was not. He stayed with his dad the whole three months. He, you know, he would come over to visit and things, but um, uh, there was no room. I was sleeping in the corner of their living room um, on a futon and had a fold-up table where I was working because I worked, I worked from the house, so I was working and also researching and investigating this issue <coughs> those three months. And... It's my understanding that you purchased uh, some type of testing or cleaning uh, equipment to try to detoxify, for lack of a better word, your home. Um, I had researched and decided on a consultant that I hired to help me determine what was in my house. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, go ahead. Are you, you said you had a mold test done. I had a mold test done with the home inspection company from that Crystal had recommended. Is that normal? That came back. Well, there was a couple of little whatever, but it was normal. Yeah. Okay. I mean, within standards or whatever. Yes. Uh, Southwest Gas, their inspection, was that normal? Yes. Right. Uh, you, I believe you purchased uh, FDA Class Two registered medical device air purifiers. I did that the consultant I we did a lot of tests a lot of different tests and he did uh, he brought in he would rent or uh, from third party bring in um, bring in the, the people that either uh, tested or um, the contractor other things you know that we might have done he was kind of the lead on that um, and he recommended this air purifier that you're when I purchased two of them. Let me, 
you could, uh, Mr. Goffey, can you put a picture of one of those? Is this the type of uh, purifier you purchased? Yes. And was the consultant that you used in terms of trying Council, to detox? Council, is that an exhibit number or is that tomorrow? No, just okay. illustrative, Your Honor. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you. I'm not asking for this document to be. No worries. Thank you. Oh. And was it Green Home Solutions? Was that the consultant you used? Yes. Oh. Oh. Eventually, after staying out of your house for three months, did your symptoms start to subside? Yes. And while you were out of your house, were you drinking real water? I was not. Oh. So now, after three months, you're starting to feel better. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. And at this point, you've done everything you can think of to make sure your house is not emitting some kind of toxic gas, correct? Yes. Do you decide to move back into the house? I did. And after moving back into the house, did you start feeling sick again? I started feeling sick again. All of these symptoms were coming back. And so now you're back in the house, the symptoms are coming back. Do you ever find out what is causing your problem? I find out about six weeks later, mid-March, um, Crystal called me up and said, I figured out what's wrong with your house. <laughs> um, I see on the news real, real, real water um, uh, recall. And the light bulb went off. Everything made sense. The questions about the doctors asking about why Alex wasn't sick, you know, trying to do their own investigation. I'm and well, now. Let me stop you there. Yeah. Did Alex drink real water? Alex did not drink the real water. So the whole time you were drinking real water in the house, Alex was not. That was a big, big question mark through the whole investigation is trying to, why wasn't he sick? Um, and it's because he didn't drink the real water because I also buy um, cases of the, you know, the Kroger water, which is what he likes. He just keeps it in his room and he doesn't, you know, that's, that's what he drinks. And then I knew Crystal and Penny had drank that water and it was just, okay, yep, that's it. And so, Ms. Sosa, just to wrap it up, you were, uh, you met with Dr. Hudson. He spoke to you about your medical records and your condition. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you heard his testimony here, correct? Yes. Uh, you're aware of the fact that you'll have to get tested for the next 20 years, twice a year, your liver uh, enzymes? Yes. And are you prepared to do that for the rest of the next 20 years of your life? Yeah, I've already done one last year. Uh, and. Were you also here when Dr. Hudson spoke about the likelihood of you having a scarred liver based upon your consumption? I did, I heard him, yes. Here, sir. Okay. Hold on a second, we've got a couple of issues. One, two people were talking at the same time, so we probably didn't get a clear question and partial answer and intervening objection. So let's, Jerry's gonna disregard the answer for this juncture. Council, I'm gonna ask you to re-ask the question, sure. pause for a second to see if I get an objection, and then the court can address it in proper order. Thank you, Gus, please. Did you hear Dr. Hudson testify that based upon your consumption of real water, that more probable than not, your liver has been scarred? Speculation here, sir. Okay. The court's going to overrule those two objections the way that question was phrased. Did she hear it? Yes, I heard it. All right. And are you uh, prepared to continue getting the testing to determine whether or not your liver function has been diminished in any way? Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Sosa. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. At this juncture, Council, cross examination by the water. Good morning, Ms. Sosa. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm good. Thank you. Good. Uh, you, we've met before. I took your deposition, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And, you know, we'll be very brief. You've seen the other questions that I've asked the other plaintiffs, haven't you? I have. Okay. Wonderful. Um, again, very sorry that real water made you sick. I want to just focus on some of the testimony that you've just provided the jury, and uh, we can wrap it up. So um, and are you aware of what your total medical bills are for all the treatment that you have had because you were made sick by real water? 
I am not. Okay. I have a fact sheet that you completed that you signed that has that number. I showed it to you without refresh your recollection. Um, sure. Yes. Your Honor, may I approach and I'll show it to you, yep. Council? Of course. We're fine with that, Sean. Okay, let's go through the approach then. Yes, sir. That was in this document? Yes. Okay. Just to, to move things along, the number in the document is $31,576.77, and it says discovery is continuing. So at the time the document was prepared, that was your medical cost to date. Is that accurate? Um, I do not know. It was, so what, when, I, when I say is it accurate, do you have a, a different number in mind, or is that the closest number that we have as we sit here today? I don't have a number. I'm just wondering what bills are included. Okay. And so one of your concerns may be that there may be some bills outside of that $31,000 that didn't get caught. That's correct. And that's fair. Um, when you prepared your response to the, the fact sheet, did you do your best to look for bills and make sure that all of your medical bills were provided to your attorney? Um, no. Do you feel like all of your bills have been provided to your attorney or are you worried that there's something out there? I think there's more out there. What are you worried about? Well, I'm worried about because I saw like 15 doctors and I'm wonder, worrying about what bills you have. It's a terrible ordeal. I'm sorry about that. So the goal is, you know, to come up with your total of medical bills. Mm -hmm. The, t the yes. total that we have been provided is $31,000. Do you believe that's accurate? If the attorneys presented that, then that's fine. That's fair. So let's talk a little bit about the ordeal you went through. Um, not only did you go to the hospital multiple times, but you then had to move out of your house. Is that true? That's correct. And you had, at the time, suspected, boy, there's got to be something in my house that's making me sick. That's correct. And so you had tests done on your house, right? Yes. And you were out of your house for three months. That's correct. And uh, when you moved back into your house, um, you drank real water again, you got sick again. That's correct. And it wasn't until you saw the re or it wasn't until your friend told you there had been a recall. That's when the light went on. And you said, this is the reason why I'm getting sick. That's correct. Okay. And so said so again, very sorry for what you went through. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, this juncture redirect counsel for plan. No, nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you so much. Sure. Is this witness excused for all purposes or subject to recall and subject to recall in what part of the case, please? She can be released for all purposes, Your Honor. Pardon? Excuse me. She can be released for all purposes, Your Honor. Thank you. Joel is for real water. She may be released for all purposes. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Please watch your step on the way down. Thank you so very much. This witness is released for all purposes. There was no jury questions. Okay. At this juncture, counsel, for plan, would you like to call your next witness, please? Thank you, Your Honor. We would call Miles from Morton. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Goldstein, appreciate it. You just saw me swear from the testimony you're about to give this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under pain and penalty of perjury. I swear. Can we have a seat? Please state and spell your name for the record. Miles Hunwardson, H U N W A R D. S E N M Y L E S. Okay, same kind of cautions you heard me say to the other witnesses. You've already I see got, got nice and close, microphones right in front of you. To pause and not have two people speaking at the same time so we get you a nice clear record. And then of course please make sure always there's an audible response, not uh -huh's, uh -huh's, things like that. So yes, sure. Appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Council, feel free to proceed with your questions on direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. 
Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Miles, could you tell the jury first where were you were born? I was born here in Las Vegas, Nevada. When? September 8th, 1990. Okay. And how did you get your name? My father wanted to name me Joshua Tree. My mother wanted to name me Michael Terrell, and they could not agree. And they were driving back and forth from Las Vegas and Bakersfield while my mother was pregnant with me. And the song by first a sign came on so many miles to Las Vegas. And then the song by the Who, I could see for miles and <laughs> and they repeat it and uh they agreed. So you're named after a song. Oh well kinda. Kinda. Okay. And then uh yeah, and they couldn't agree on a middle name. You know, my dad wanted it Joshua Tree. My mom wanted it Michael Terrell, so I just never got a middle name. Okay. So you have no middle name? Nope. Okay. All right. Where did you go to school? I elementary school. I went to Mendoza and then Mountain View, which are both uh, east side Nevada, uh, Las Vegas. And then for middle school, I went to O'Callahan. And then for high school, I went to El Dorado, home of the Sun Devils. When did you graduate from high school? 2009. What was your first job? Uh, while I was in high school, I was a courtesy clerk, and then I became a pizza delivery driver. And then outside of high school, I worked at Road Safe Traffic Control, warehouse slash road closures. Then I moved to Elko, Nevada to drive a 100-ton haul truck. And then I moved back to Las Vegas, Nevada to become an iron worker following in my father's uncle great uncle grandfather's footsteps and when did you become an iron worker august 2012. okay and can you tell the jury a little bit about what an iron worker does here in las vegas it's not a mixed local so there's two iron worker locals i'm 416 which is reinforcing concrete we place all the rebar we tie it we do bridge decks you know, all the high rises, parking garages, you know, anything that's really big with a lot of weight that needs rebar, which is like, you know, the bones of the building. And yes. And can you tell the jury some of the bigger projects you've worked on here in Las Vegas? Uh, Project Neon. So when all the freezeways were stopped, I was getting her done. And then uh, MSG, Raider Stadium, Circa. I did the Las Vegas intake because uh, our lake got low, so they planned on making another water intake, and I actually got to help on that. We were 450 feet underground, under the lake. That was a really cool, neat job. Okay, and MSG, what, what was that? Uh, Madison Square Garden Sphere. Yeah, that's the big thing we see globally. Yes. Right. All right. In 2018, the year 2018, what were your plans? In towards the end of 2018, I moved. Well, I didn't move. I came back to Las Vegas. I uh, traveled to San Francisco to work. I stayed for eight months, made a ton of money. And when I came back, I you know don't know what to spend it on, so I figured I might as well invest it. So I told my mother to pick out a home. And, you know, I told her what I was approved for, said, now pick out a home and, you know, that's where we'll live. And, you know, when I get a family, I'll move out. But um, and the reason I we kind of did that deal is my brother bought a house. He was working in California, had my mother moved in and then he got a wife and got her pregnant and kicked my mother out. <laughs> and so she had a lease somewhere else. And right when I was coming back from San Francisco, that lease was up. And it just kind of worked out. And, and about when was that? 2018? That was 2018. Do you remember the month? A quarter even? Um, uh, towards okay. the end. And at that time, were you 
dating? Uh, well, I had dated and, you know, I kind of knew that I wasn't going to marry, you know, whoever it was that I was dating, you know, more or less at the beginning. I knew right away and, um, you know, I broke hearts and, you know, it don't <laughs> feel good. It don't. And uh, so I decided to work on myself because I realized to get the perfect woman, you got to be the perfect man. And I just kind of went on a, you know, path to better myself. You know, I already ate really good. I didn't eat fast food. I don't eat packaged food, canned food, bagged food. If it was, you know, processed, it was a no-no for me. So, I mean, I already had that going, but just as far as, you know, just little things here, you know, every day, one step towards being better, you, you know. And why were you trying to improve yourself? To, to find a wife and start making big. I wanted to, I always joke, want to have 10 plus kids and I'm 33 and I've got zero. Okay. So in 2018, your plans were to try to find someone to get married? Yes. Okay. And date to marry, not date for fun. Okay. Is the conclusion I came to. Did you go to the hospital in September 2019? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the time period before going to the hospital? Yeah, how that worked out was I didn't get 40 hours of work, so I switched companies because uh, the other company had MSG and they were working tons of overtime. So, uh, you know, I kind of jumped ship, which, you know, they weren't mad at me or nothing. They completely understand. But so I, while I was working there, and on Saturday, the superintendent for the new company came, I invited him to go dirt bike riding. So, and then they invited me to, uh, Lucas Palooza it was this little boy, he had a dire issue and it was like a fundraiser for him. So I don't remember if it was there or on the job site where I invited the super to get, uh, go dirt bike riding, because I was always told how fast he was and everyone tells me that I'm fast. So, you know, just kind of, but anyway, so Saturday comes and towards the end of the night, I start to feel sick. Well, Sunday morning when I'm supposed to go dirt bike riding with the super of the company that I just switched to, I, you know, really don't want to go, but you know, you can't call out. So I went and right away in the ride, I knew something was wrong. My vision felt like a yellow tent and I just was in like cold sweats. I couldn't think, I couldn't ride. And uh, so I just told him, you know, hey, I, you know, I don't know what's up, you know, I can't make it. And he's like, all right. And he continued on with his ride and I made it back to my truck. And then Monday comes and, you know, I don't remember. Before, how... we, get, before we get to Monday, okay. were you drinking real water at that time? Yes. What kind? Uh, both. I had the home delivery and for work, I liked the liter jugs. I would bring them in my lunchbox, and you know, the water bottle don't last forever, so I would buy, you know, boxes of it from convenience stores. Okay. Go ahead. You we were at, I think we we're at moving to Monday. Yeah. So okay. Monday comes, it's the second week of work at the new company on MSG, and that first week, um, you know, they were real impressed with how I was slapping together beams, so they kind of gave me a little crew. And, you know, by Thursday, I had the crew. Friday, Saturday came. So now it's Monday. My crew meets up with me, and we're going to slap in these beams to stay ahead of the top uh, map with, you know. And, uh, but I don't know what, I don't, I don't know what to, I don't know how to direct. I'm not, I can't even tell myself what to do. I just can't focus and, and you know I'm usually got tons of patience and you know I can if someone's really upsetting me I can like crack a joke or laugh it off or whatever but this day I'm snapping I'm like you know freaking out telling people to get away from me quit talking to me you know I don't know leave me alone and I decide you know I need to go home and uh you know, they kind of, hey, you'll be glad Friday, you know, and then they point out other iron workers because there was like 140 of us on the job. So you can imagine a lot of people try to hide, tuck away and not work. So, you know, the people that, you know, 
don't want me to leave because I'm sick. They would rather me go sit in the shade and get paid, you know, because they're friends like that. They're like, you know, convince me to stay that they'll take care of me. So I end up working the 12 hour shift. And at that time, there was no parking at MSG where we're getting bussed in. So I have to get on the bus and then where our uh, vehicles were parked, we're way out off a of Blue Diamond, past Blue Diamond off of Jones. There was like some lot way out there. So I get on the bus, the first bus comes and it's already filled up by the time I got out of the job site, out of the turnstile gates. And, uh, but I know I can't wait for the next bus. Like I'm, I'm falling out. So I climb on, they're like, hey, there ain't no seats. I just lay down on the floor. I don't even care. They're telling me something. I don't care. You know, I'm an iron worker. <laughs> Who are you to tell me anything, right? That's our mentality. Uh, so anyway, they wake me up because now we're at the parking lot. I felt, and driving, you know, you know, I can nod out. But as soon as I switch driver's passenger, I'm wide awake. I've never been able to sleep in a vehicle but I slept the whole ride to the parking lot. So they wake me up. Hey, we're trying to get off. We don't want to step on you. So I'm like, okay. So I get in my truck and, you know, I, I can't even keep my head up, you know, so I, you know, it's hot. It's summer. I turn on the AC full blast, kick the seat back, and I'm going to take a nap before I try to drive home. Well, I wake up. It's still daylight. And like, I remember like rolling my head and like, I couldn't even lift up my eyes. So I'm like, you know, I'll take another nap. This time when I wake up now, it's dark. And I remember telling myself, if I don't drive home, I'm never going home. And um, that's more or less my last memory until uh, the anesthesia wore off and I woke up in the hospital after transplant. And what day was that? Um, so. Monday, Tuesday. What? Uh, that was Monday that, you know, the, my last memory is driving home. So I get home, my mom made a great big dinner. I tell her I, I can't eat. She gives me a hard time, she says. So I sit down, try to take a bite, and I'm like, look, I, I can't eat. And she's like, okay. So I go lay down, and uh, I don't even shower. I'm still filthy from work, and, you know, that's my first step every time when I get home is shower because, you know, you're filthy. And uh, so anyway, I get in bed. Tuesday comes. She makes me breakfast. Again, I turn it down. I just want water. Wednesday comes. What kind of water? Well, home delivery, real water. Go ahead. And um, so Wednesday comes, same thing. I don't eat. And, you know, and looking back, she says I was acting real loopy. But at the time, she's just like, whatever, kid. And so Thursday morning comes. And for whatever reason, she goes into my bathroom and looks in my toilet. And my urine's like <laughs> literally the color of this microphone, like vibrant uh like hawaiian punch almost and uh she's like oh so she you know hey we're going to the emergency room and i tell her no i'm fine i just need to rest and she's like no you've been telling me that for four days you ain't got no better you're just getting worse we need to go so she loads me up in her car she gets to the front of henderson hospital emergency room and you know i get out and go in and then she parks her car and she comes in and in my room, I got blackout curtains, and I refused to let her turn on the light while I was, you know, tired and sick. So she hasn't got a look at me, and it was early in the morning when we drove, so the sun still wasn't up. So she still really hasn't got a look at me, but as soon as she walked into the hospital and me under the light, her first words was, oh, my God, you're yellow. And, you know, the intake people were trying to get information out of me, but who knows what. I don't know. I don't think they got anything. But as soon as my mom said that after she walked in, they both took another look at me and were like, oh, whoa. So they took me straight to the back, started running tests. And my mother, uh, a nurse, comes in and says, you know, he can go in a coma and he will die if he does. And a doctor hasn't ordered this. I can get in a lot of trouble, lose my job. You know, the whole spiel and then jabs my stomach full of vitamin K. I don't remember the name of the other one but another a different nurse comes in same spiel says this boy's about to die and jabs it in my arm so they're trying to figure out uh what's wrong with me finally they decide that you know i need to go to a transplant facility or you know i will not make it there's no facility in las vegas that could you know handle uh what i needed so they organized through my 
uh, uh, flight. Uh, it wasn't a helicopter. It was a plane ride. And you remember that? No, I don't. Uh, this is all you know told to me. Okay, tell the jury the last thing you remember before. That was the drive home. This, huh? The last thing I remember. The last thing you remember for the plane ride was the drive home. Right, and so there was a plane ride. We've seen the records. There was an operation. We've seen the records. What do you remember next? So I woke up, and you know, it was like, you know, you're in the. I was in a room, you know, with all the monitors, with all the doctors and the masks, and you know, I. They had me on some type of drug that was supposed to keep me, you know, asleep for. I'm not sure the amount of time, but I, after the surgery, they want to keep you asleep for a good long time to kind of let your body mend because they do the precision so precise that I don't know. But anyway, so uh, whatever drug it was, it had no effect on me. The steroid that they were using had tons of effects. So as soon as the anesthesia wore off that they took me off of it, I woke up and I still had the ventilator down that was breathing for me. And I just kept you know, telling them I can't breathe, you need to take this out. And they're like, no, you can breathe. It's a ventilator, it's breathing for you. But I just kept telling them, no, I can't breathe. You need to take this out. You need to take this out. And my mom was in the room. Finally, my mom flipped the gasket on them. So they, you know, said, okay, you know, we'll take it out. They took it out. And then I just kept telling them, I need water. I need water. I'm thirsty. And they're like, you know, you just had a liver transplant. You can't have no water. You know, we need to make sure everything's working right, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, I need water right now. You need again. So finally, they approved this sponge, which was, uh, I, I don't know. It was some weird color, but they would just let me bite into it and suck the moisture out. And that was all I got on the hour, every hour. So I'm just watching the clock, waiting, because I looked at what time it was when they gave it to me, and then I just watched the clock for probably four or five hours, waiting for my sponge, because I'm like dying of thirst, I think. So uh, I tell them, I'm like, look, you need to give me something more than the sponge. And they're like, no, this is all, you're not even supposed to be getting this right now. You know, they're trying to, talk me out of it and I'm like I'm like I'm telling you right now you're gonna give me more and uh, so they put the sponge in my mouth and I bite down on it and I rip my head back and I tell them I'm gonna chew this up and swallow it or you're gonna give me some water and uh, you know they try to talk me out of it and I you know start and they're hold, he's holding on to it and I whatever the sponge was connected to I rip it out now I have the sponge it's in my mouth and I'm telling them bro I'm not playing and so they say, okay, okay, we'll give you some ice chips. So they bring in this little Dixie cup with, you know, maybe that much. And they get the sponge for me. Well, well I think I, I don't remember exactly. But anyway, I get the Dixie cup. And uh, those ice chips were like heaven. I mean, I've never been so satisfied in my life. So now I'm excited, you know, watching the clock for each hour. Where's my ice chips? And, uh, and, uh, after, you know, and, you know, I started telling them that wasn't enough, but I was truly still satisfied with that. I was just seeing what I could get away with at this point. So I wasn't trying that hard, but, you know, I kept commenting, I need one more, I want more. So they eventually gave me water. And, uh, and uh, I never, for four days in the ICU, I never went to sleep. Whatever that steroid was, it, uh, I just couldn't go to sleep. And uh, so... Uh, the surgery got completed late at night, so this is all late at night. Now it's daytime, and, you know, I'm still in the same room. After the surgery, they moved me to the room. How long did the surgery take, do you know? I think six hours, or... It was over the course of more than Yeah, they s started, you know, at 10 or so on, uh, I believe, the 23rd. And then they completed it on the 24th. Okay. So and uh, How long did you have to stay in ICU? Four days. Okay. And this is at UCLA? UCLA. Okay. And then what happened? So during those four days, I'm driving the ICU nuts because uh, the very first day, 
It's not even been 12 hours since surgery. Their physical therapist decides to come in and talk to me. And he asks me if I think I can walk. So I swing my feet off the bed and I'm about to show his ass or show him I can walk. Okay. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, and apparently the bed's super high raised. I didn't realize that. So they're like, hold on, hold on. They lower the bra bed. I feel my feet hit the ground and my feet feel like, you know, balloons just swollen. And I'm like, oh. Uh, but anyway, he puts this belt around. They put a pillow on my chest and they put this belt around me and he's supposed to help me. And I keep telling him, like, dude, I got this. You know, you're hurting me with your with your belt. So we make it like halfway down the hall. And that was the picture. We saw. Yep. Right. That was the picture. And uh, what is all that stuff that was hooked up? Uh, it was tons of different things, antivirals, anti-rejections, uh, the steroid, just, you know, all kinds of different things, uh, magnesium, a couple of different minerals because, you know, I was depleted. I, you know, had, okay, so had did you make it down the hall walking? Yeah, I made it down the hall and the guy kept doing this and I lost it. You know, doing what? Doing uh, well. He's supposed to hold me with the thing, but I, to me, clearly could support myself. So every time he, you know, did a check, you know, I just had that thing, and even though there was a pillow with the belt, it didn't feel good. So I, you know, you were a wild horse. Yeah, I kind of, okay. you know, told him he better back away from, better not get in arm's reach, to put it simply. And went back to my bed, and then once he was gone, I would talk the nurses into letting me go for walks, and they wouldn't. They would put the belt around with no pillow, and they would hold it, but it was like you know at its own weight. They weren't never, and so I'm just doing laps every time that I'm bored. I want to do laps and uh, laps with that rack. Uh, yeah, well, you have to have the Christmas tree with you if you go anywhere, you know. So. Yes, I had the rack with me, you know, and that was whoever. And in the ICU, you have a designated nurse that checks on you every hour on the hour if they're not in the room with you the whole time. So I had someone to drag my tree around, no problem. And uh, so they, I remember one, they come in to see how uh, sane I am, I suppose, and they're asking me all these questions, and, and I'm, you know, looking at my wristband, and I'm like, you got the answers right here, you got to, you know, and they're like, yeah, you're fine, but, uh, so, you know, they asked me if I thought I could go to the West Wing, you know, or actually, I was telling them that I don't need to be in the ICU, and all, but I was just blowing smoke, you know, I kind of like that, so they moved me out of the ICU room, and I start freaking out, and I hadn't slept for four days, so now I'm telling them, you know, no, I think I might need a, you know, so while they're rolling me down the hall, you know, I'm, you know, confessing to the two people. I'm like, I don't think I was ready, you know, and they're like, no, stop it, you're fine. So they move me in this other hall, and uh, I just, you know, have like, I think it's dusty, and they literally have someone come in, clean the vents, you know, and, and all, the, and it's nighttime, it's, you know, the, the nurses work 12 hour shifts and it was the night 12 hour you know getting ready for the next one so it's so everyone's eyes are red but in my head it's because all the dust in the air that their eyes are red so i'm freaking out and i decide that i'm not going to stay in the west wing that i'm going back to the icu so i take my christmas tree and i start walking down the ha uh, hall in my gown that i put on i could not tie the bag <laughs> And, you know, I'm, I'm walking down the hall barefoot thinking I'm going back to the ICU. And mind you, I hadn't slept this whole time. And uh, so they're, you know, one of the nurses comes and they're like, you know, you, where do you think you're going? And I tell them and they're like, you can't leave this wing. And I'm like, you know, watch me. And so she grabs the Christmas tree. We kind of have a tug of war. And then I step away from the Christmas tree and I got tons of IVs and wrists, elbows, the everywhere. So I 
go like this and I, you know, get the all the cords in my hands and I tell them, I'm like, I will rip this out. You better let go of my Christmas tree. And she goes, I won't. So I took three steps back with all my might and not one cord broke. They all just suit and they didn't even give me new cords after I got back in because everything was working fine. Like those cords are pretty durable. And uh, so but they, anyway, did, they did, tell me did that you they're going to back to ICU or just stay? they they uh, they tell me that you know you know one of the nurse I don't know how because all the people I didn't care what they said because they weren't like did you go back to ICU she, yes the well this nurse came up and she broke it down to me she you know spoke to me like I was you know a real person she was like you know broke it down what they're you know, they're about to move me to the psych ward, all this different stuff. You can't go back to the ICU. There are no more beds uh, on this floor. You know, maybe tomorrow if something comes up, we might be able to move you. But look, this is where you're at. You know, like, like think about where you're at, what you're doing, what you're saying. And I was like. Were you having a little bit of trouble processing? Well, I hadn't slept for four days, so I was, you know, highly agitated at anything. But she, she. Brought me back to reality, you know. So I went back to the room, and uh, my mother, you know, told him like, "Why don't you give him something to go to sleep?" You know, like, get, oh, they tried to give me Ambien, but my mom freaked out. And was like, "That makes people crazy. This kid's already going through an episode. You want to give him that?" She's like, "Something else." How long did you stay in the hospital? Uh, five day, four days in the ICU, five days in the West Wing, nine days total after transplant okay this is all ucla all at ucla and then what happened you, you they finally let you out of the hospital then where did you go i uh stayed close to the hospital per doctor's orders for as long as i could afford it and then i you know went back to vegas and i still came back every you know whenever i was told to come back but uh you know, they, I was supposed to be like right next to the hospital, but you know, who can afford that? And, uh, and so. Did, did they give you medication to take? Yes. When I first got out of the hospital, you know, those antivirals, anti, just stuff so you don't get an infection or sick or anything. And all the anti rejections, they gave me a bunch of, uh, well, not a bunch. They gave me a couple muscle relaxers and pain pills, but I, uh, never, I never took those because, you know, I, I don't know, it just didn't seem. But uh, did they prescribe the immunosuppressive anti? Yeah, that was the only ones that I pretty much took, up because they said I absolutely tackle limus and mycophenolate. Okay. And how often do you have to take those? Every twelve hours. So, morning and night. Yep. And they explain why you had to take those drugs. Because your immune system will attack the foreign liver and virtually, you know, have your body eliminate it. And uh, you need a liver to survive. Did there come a time you got back to Vegas? Yeah. When? Uh, shortly after the transplant, I came back to Vegas and... Uh, and then any time that I have to go back, I fly. Well, first we drove, but uh, you literally have to leave at like 11 at night because traffic's so bad that um, you will you won't make it to the appointment on time. So this is L.A. This is L.A. leaving from here to go make my appointment. And um, then, so now I just fly. I go alone and just fly. So you have to go down there still monthly or? No, now it's uh, every six months. Uh, I, I, every four months to, you know, unless, you know, they want, want it more. But every four months I get my blood uh, checked. Now it's, it was every month. It, you know, as time progresses, it gets less and less, but it'll always be at least once a year um, for the, for the, physical visit and then for the blood testing every six months did they assign a transplant coordinator for you yes uh lifelong the cord my coordinator is alice lee and um miss lee's been your coordinator since since it since started and she will be rather i pass or she passes but we will be you know for the remainder of this 
and how often do you have to communicate with them? Uh, I'm talking about the coordinator now. Uh, well, they message me and I just respond, but I don't ever message them. Okay. All right. When you got back to Vegas, did you go back to work at any point? So I, yes, came back to Vegas and uh, I have like a desert lot behind my house. So to get exercise, well, already I would, every day after work, I'd walk my dogs. But that was what I decided I would do to try to get back because, you know, just walking a few feet, I would be out of breath and, you know, feel like I was going to faint after the thing because, you know, I was probably like 150 pounds. And then when I came out of the hospital, I was 118. So, but, uh, uh, you're trying to get your strength. Yeah. So I would throw my dogs over the wall, jump over the wall. What kind of dogs are they? Uh, they're little Yorkies. Two Yorkies and one, I don't know what he is. He's white and his hair's curly. My mom says Deshaun, but I've seen a picture of a Deshaun. He don't look like a Deshaun. Okay. Well, in any event, you, you started yeah, trying look, to get some exercise by walking the dogs. Yep. And uh, get your strength back. Yep. And then uh, I had to go back to work because I didn't. I wasn't collecting unemployment because I wasn't capable of working. So I, you know, even though everyone told me, even the company, they're like, dude. And, but, I, you know, I just, you know, I did. They went back to work. So uh, November 6th, I, you know, I was working at a MSG. So that's where I, you know, want to go back. My brother was also on that job site and my father. So, um, and, you know, I already made a really good reputation because uh, that was my first time working for that company. Mm. And uh, so everyone, you know, I had a I had a real good rep. So when I when I was like, hey, you know, I need to come to work. They were like, right on. We'll put you in the, you know, column cage, which is, you know, you just stand there and you just tie. And it's, you know, probably the easiest job that they had. And uh, I did that. And uh, every chance that someone would call out sick that was on the deck crew, because, you know, I like the heavy stuff. I want to go, I want to go work. And uh, so I would always volunteer to go to whichever deck crew. And, you know, eventually I made it to a deck crew. And, uh, and then that's just where I was at. Was your ability to work different after the liver transplant than it was before? Yeah, for, you know, especially at the beginning, building back up my strength. But now, you know, that it's been four years out, I would say, like, before, everyone was always impressed at, like, my stamina. I would just, you know, like, say we're punking out the bridge decks for Project Neon. By first break, whoever my partner is, they're like, hey, dude, I, I'm not, I can't go back to that. So I'll get someone else. And then at lunchtime, same thing, I'll get someone else. And, you know, and I was, like, known for, you know, running people into the dirt. You know, and, you know, when there would be a new kid and they want to test his, you know, grit, they would send me on them, you know. And, uh, but I don't have that no more, the unlimited power. I mean, I'm still a tough guy compared to, you know, some, but I don't have that unlimited just stamina like I used to. But, you know. But you're still working. Oh, yeah. yeah. And have you had any problems doing your job? Uh... So I believe it's the tacrolimus. It makes, you know, when I'm doing something real delicate, you know, like thread a needle or something with my fingers, you know, I tend to get shaky, especially when I first got on it. It was, I looked like I had Parkinson's when I would try to eat, but my body, you know, got taller and I suppose, but when I'm at work, you know, not right away at the beginning of the day, but, you know, after you're, you know, broke a sweat per se, I'll notice that, you know, my plier hands, you know, going to grab the wire, you feed the wire with your left hand, you grab it with your right, and you, you know, make your ties. But, it, you know, I'll be like a little shaky, and uh, I just don't like that. Is it getting worse? Um, well, it's pretty consistent. I don't, you know, some days are worse than others, but it, I contributed to, you know, how big of a lunch I had or, you know, what part of the day I'm at or how, you know, fatigued I am, you know, it all plays a part. Okay, now you've already told us you have to take the anti-rejection drugs every day, twice a day, right? 
and you've said you have to communicate with the transplant coordinator on a regular basis, right? Do you have to take any other tests because of the liver transplant? Yes, I'm yearly I um, need to get skin monitorization and the density of my bones checked, scanned. Okay, and the, the skin monitoring, that's because of the, the potential for skin cancer? Both of the anti-rejections, one of the known side effects is skin cancer. Okay, and can you tell the jury how they do these skin tan cancer uh, tests without getting into too yeah. graphic? Okay. So, I don't know, I've kind of been in denial on this, so I only did so I've only done one one year after transplant. The my coordinators were really adamant that I need to get the baseline. I'll be able to tell that if it had deteriorated, and they won't know. And if it does, you know, there's more medications they'll put me on to try to. But anyway, so that was the only reason that I did do it, and. So I got the bone one and the skin one was like right in the same area. So I did that one too. And when they did the skin one, uh, it was a lady and three other people were in there, but she has me stripped down. And then after I'm already naked, she asked me if it's okay if they stay that they're students. And I remember thinking, what? It's a little late to ask now, but I'm like, yeah, it's fine. So I have to turn around and, uh, I think I had my hands covering my private, you know, because it was some ladies and a dude. And it just, you know, I felt, I'm not that shy, but in that setting, I turns out I'm shy. And uh, so she's like, you know, don't cover nothing, blah, blah. So I do a turn, and then I got dressed, and that was it. But uh, it wasn't a good experience. I haven't gone back. But you, you are going to have to go back. Yes. And you will go back. Yes. I actually have... Uh, scheduled uh, skin screening and I have to uh, get a referral the bone density one wasn't as easy to just acquire on my own and uh, the coordinator doesn't order that I have to get a primary I have to go see a primary doctor and then have him get me one and it's you know I just go hey give me this and you know because of my transplant there's no question okay here you go and, you know, okay. um, still a process, though. And did they tell you any other potential problems from taking the anti-rejection drugs? Off uh, top of my head right now, I'm drawing okay. a blank. Did they did they tell you there would potentially be a problem if you, you had? Children? Oh, yes. The other than the bone density one, that one, because I'm very active, I ski bike, dirt bike, BMX, like, it, you know, stream, like, talking big jumps. But uh, I wish I could show a video because, you know, well, to get, speaking of it, it's... Let's get back to what they feel told like you about the potential. I'm sorry. Okay, the potential problems? Uh, is birth defects. Uh, and I haven't really had a girlfriend since this whole incident. Why not? Uh, I just, uh, I don't know. I just, uh, just overwhelming, I suppose. Because of your condition, because Could, of the potential problems? Because of the, yeah, well, yeah, the birth defects. You know, what if I do find the woman of my dreams and I get married and now it's time to have kids and, and you know, you, I don't know. It's just scary to think about. I haven't really processed it. I haven't really thought about it. Okay. And you mentioned you you still engage in a lot of physical activities. Yes. Are you trying to lead the best possible life you can under the circumstances? Yeah, I pretend it didn't happen. You know, I just uh, go out and enjoy the sunlight, even though I'm not supposed to be in the sun. You know, I. I just try to try. I pretend it didn't happen, and I just live it like my life, like it didn't happen. Thank you, Miles. Cross examination, Mayor Thank you. Pause for quick second. One second. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. Um, go ahead with your cross-examination, Council. Thank you, Your Honor. Thanks so much. Still good morning. Good morning, Mr. Honorson. How are you? Good morning, Mr. O'Toole. Good. How are you? I'm good. Very nice to talk to you. Uh, I wanted to uh, follow up on some of the questions that Mr. Kemp asked you um, because I think uh, I, I will give you credit. Some of them are quite remarkable. You got out of the hospital and you went back to work. Yes, sir. Uh, what was, and I lost the timeline, but it was a pretty brief period. How long when you got out of the hospital? I got out of the hospital October 3rd, went back to work November 6th. So, you know. And so um, from, October 3rd till November 6th, you sort of built up your strength and then... I, uh... To, my mentality was, uh, to clarify, uh, so when I would walk the dogs, I would be out of breath and, you know, I couldn't do it. And my mom was trying to talk me out of going back to work. But when you're at work, you're, you're just a different mindset it don't matter if you're tired it don't matter none of that you're at work and you're there to do a job and i knew that about myself so i knew that if i went to work i could make it through an eight hour day no problem you know walking because my mom was trying to force me to walk the dogs for you know at least two hours and i could you know i'm like no nah, this is i no, i don't you know you uh my you know, the power of your mind when you want to do something versus when you don't, you know, is, you know, your attitude, 90% what happens to you, 10% your attitude towards it, you know, and I didn't want to walk the dogs no more, so I'm out of breath. But if I'm at work, I want to be at work, I'm not going to get out of breath. So. Uh, Mr. Hunterson, do you know the total amount of your medical bills? I believe you, uh, my attorneys through all the resources that they could acquire, they've came up with the number, yes. Okay, does the number of 683,000 and change sound about right to you? Yes. Okay, terrific. Um, I wanna talk a little bit uh, more about uh, when you went back to work. So you went back to work um, and it was with Harris Rebar, is that right? Yes. And they were, what project were you working on when you went M back? MSG. And that's the sphere, right? Yes, sir. And. Can you tell the jury a little bit about what you did when you first went back? When I first went back, I was in the column yard and we were just pre-tying the cages for the beams, which is, uh, uh, so it, it looks like a horseshoe would be the tie. And then we would use number four rebar, which is pretty much scrap because it gets, you know, number 11 big bar in the bottom of the beam once they get it. But we would pre-tie the cages. That was the step that I was doing. And so it's the horseshoe, you know, at a foot on center or six inches on center. And uh, you would just, you know, set up a template, load it all up and with two number four bars that run, you know, the full length of however long it is, you would cut the bars to side, say they only needed, you know, a 22 foot cage and your number fours are 30 footer, you know, you would grab out how many you need, cut them to size, build your template, build up the cage and then drag it to the side. So each pour, you know, needed so many cages. So the guy in the the foreman for the column yard would write out tags and set them out and then you would just grab a tag read what it needs and then build it so when i first came back i just kind of stood there and as i would take it upon myself to you know jump in and do more i ended up being like the the foreman guy, he was never doing nothing. He was having me write the tags and kind of organize. Because I like that. I like, you know, I take it upon myself and, you know, it just makes it easier if the, yeah. I appreciate that. So um, I don't think the jury has poured concrete or built reinforcing cages, but the way I understand it as a layperson is uh, this is the, the steel that goes on the building or the bridge or whatever, and then they pour concrete and the steel is giving it additional strength. Is that the gist of it? 
So, yes, the concrete can withstand, you know, immense weight, but concrete's very brittle. It cracks, and if it cracks, then it breaks. So what the rebar does is something for the concrete to bond to, and the rebar has flex, so it can bend, and it allows, you know, it allows a little bit of, you know, flex, but it initially just keeps the concrete bonded so it can continue to support, you know, all of the weight. So this is um, fairly labor intensive work. Isn't oh, it? hi. It's out of all construction jobs, it's by far the most physically demanding. And it sounds like when you first went back, it was 12 hour days already? Yep. Uh, at MSG, they uh, had a lot of money, so they were trying to get that one done. Yeah, they're trying to finish it. That's the uh, where the U2 concerts are. Is that? Yep. That was, I believe, the first concert that uh, the first venue that the MSG held. So um, I believe. When, I don't know, though. Fair enough. Just out of curiosity, when you went back, um, were you initially able to work overtime as well, or was it just, hey, I'll do normal shifts and kind of ease? So, so-called ease back into it for an iron worker. No, uh, whatever they were working on the crew that I was on, that's what I would work. And the column crew, pretty much we were always way ahead. So even if some of the deck crews had to work 10, the column crew usually got cut out at eight hours. Okay. And pretty much you guys have to put the steel together and have it ready to go before they can pour concrete, right? Yes. The, uh, it has to be 100 complete placed and done and then an inspector for the city the job site and sometimes we have a quality control person on our end but you know not always depending on how big the job site is uh and then once everything's that yes this is to code everything looks right then they pour it yes sir gotcha. and it sounds like um on this particular job it sounds like you're kind of a leader in your in what you do i mean even before the transplant but even but after it sounds like i that's just kind of a a role that i've put my with wherever i go all all of the and i don't want to put words in your mouth is it fair to say that you're kind of supervising no uh i wouldn't say supervise it's more of like a lead guy you know like you know i i know enough of what's going on that you know if if you know people can ask me hey you know what to do without you know bothering the foreman or or you know and then you know say i see people you know not really doing much you know i take it upon myself hey do this do this and let's get this done and you know and everyone respects me because i work hard so if i you know tell any no one ever gets sour because they know you know i'll do it myself if they don't fast and make them look bad good for you when did the uh the spear or at least your part of the spear get done what when the work was done out there and you moved on to the next project i actually left that project before it got completed and when did you leave that project to go to the next one um about just an approximate I want to say in 2021 in like December. Okay, so if it, the rebar part of it that you were working on finished about December. Of no, no, uh, it was still the job started slowing down, and uh, that's why I cut out. But uh, it was still tons of work left to do. It just wasn't you know 140 iron workers getting you know the overtime. Gotcha. But they kept you on. Towards the end of it, and then in December ish, you think that's about when it got finished? That's when I left, okay. but it, it uh, was still going on. All right. Um, my dad and my brother were still working at that job, they, they stayed on. Gotcha. Uh, another interesting thing I wanted to ask you about it sounds like you enjoy off roading. Would oh, that yeah. Be fair to say? Oh, yeah. Um, Anything on two wheels with handlebars. Um, well, even side bike is a side by side two wheels or four wheels. Uh, ski bike is what I said that started with an S. I don't. I, I, uh, I've ridden passenger in a side by side, but I, I, I'm not into that. I like That's dirt bikes. Okay. Nah. Uh, same question then. When after the transplant, after you go back to work, when do you pick up riding again? So, 
after the first week of work, I decided, well, if I can work, I can dirt bike. So I went dirt bike riding that following weekend. Good for you. Um, and you've continued dirt bike riding uh, since? Oh, yeah. <laughs> one point did you have an accident while dirt bike riding it was shortly after well i've had many accidents which one in particular one where you where you got injured and you had to go to a hospital so uh it was i want to say it was in february i could be mistaken might have been earlier but uh shortly after transplant i was dirt bike riding with this kid chase and his father tom tom's my buddy uh uh, we, you know, since I was a kid going camping out at Dumont, but he's, you know, my dad's friend, but, you know, we just, you know, he's my buddy. I'm his buddy, I guess is a better way to put it. But, uh, so I'm out riding with him and his boy, and his boy's faster than me. And, you know, like I said, I'm fast. So, you know, we're like racing each other. And, uh, I don't know, I was probably fourth gear pinned, come around a berm, and I hit a rock. And the rock, you know, was buried some so it didn't budge it just kicked me sideways and you know i kind of helicoptered uh i I, rem I don't i remember being like sprawled out and like flying through the air like this and then i got wrapped around another rock on my side and uh so it hurt and i i tried to ride kept riding and maybe two minutes into the ride i stopped and tell them hey that crash actually hurt i'm going back to the truck you know, and they're like, you want us to follow you? I'm like, nah, I'll be fine. And uh, they ended up making it back to the truck before me. But what anyway. Happened? Yeah, what happened next? So I uh, get to the truck, drive home, stay in bed all day Sunday, all day Monday, all day Tuesday. And Tuesday, my mom's tripping on me. She's like, this is what you did last time, and you almost died. You need to go to the doctor. And I know I'm just hurt, bruised, you know. So I'm like, I'll go to work tomorrow. So I go to work Wednesday, and uh, everyone at work is kind of telling me the same thing my mom did. Hey, bro, you don't look too good. You know, you're pale white. Your lips are all chapped. You, you know, <laughs> you need to go to the doctor, bro. So I went home. I took a shower because uh, last time when I was at UCI, I never showered. I, I guess this isn't important. But anyway, so I made sure I showered. It was important to you. Yeah, yeah. I realized how filthy I was when I was in the ICU and I lost it. But, uh, you know, they did that surgery and let me sit how many days and I still got all this work done, but I was freaking out. But anyway, uh, I go to work, everyone tells me the same thing. I go home, take a shower, and then I go to Henderson Hospital. And, uh, you know, I tell them that I crashed and my side hurts and, you know, it's a little swollen. So they do a cat scan some type of scan and they tell me that well your kidney your spleen and your liver are bleeding you got internal bleeding and they're like we can't handle this so they throw me in an ambulance send me to UMC UMC starts to de dressing me and then they see my you know my wound and uh, they're like whoa when'd you get that and I tell them and they start laughing they're like dude we can't touch you with a 10-foot pole so they slide me to the back and meanwhile, I keep telling them I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. I haven't eaten all day. I haven't drinking. You know, you need to get me some water. And they're, you know, telling me, well, if you get flown to UCLA and they need to do surgery, you know, you don't need, you can't have nothing in your belly. We can't give you no water. And it felt like forever, but it was probably five plus hours or so. It was a long time. And I'm getting mad and getting rude. And uh, so I asked one of the nurses, and, you know, like, dude, and he's like, when would you crash again? And I go, Saturday. And he goes, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And you ain't bled to death yet. And he walked away. I was like, no, no, duh. So I signed myself out. Uh, stopped at Pizza Rock because it's right there by UMC. Got some food and drink. And uh, <laughs> uh, stayed in bed for the remainder of the week. And then Monday went back to work and was fine. So, um, you have a, a transplant coordinator. Is it Alice? Alice. Uh, I take it Alice was probably not very happy about that. Uh, they, uh, I think when we talked in person, it was brought up, but uh, I, they never responded to UMC, and until I saw them, they, they, they weren't too worried, apparently.
you got better on your own. Yep. And um, have there been times when Alice has been unhappy with you taking your medications? And yes. Getting tested? Yes. What, what, what types of My things? levels will be raised, and she'll ask why. And, uh, you know, usually I, I give her the excuse, you know, I'm missing doses. She's like, well, you can't do that. You know, it's very important. Goes through this field, and I say, okay. Get it taken care of. Yes. And, um, yes, uh, let me just ask, uh, let me just take one second while I look at something. I think that might be everything I have. Um, oh, I know. Um, since uh, uh, more recently, how has uh, UCLA told you you're doing? Great. Glad to hear it. Mr. Hunwardson, again, very sorry that uh, the real water you drank made you very ill. Thank you very much. I don't have any further questions. Council, redirect. No questions, Your Honor. Pardon? No further questions. Okay. We would excuse it for all purposes, Your Honor. Anticipate my next question, Councilor Planning. Is that the same? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Just please watch your step on the way down like everybody else. Thank you so much. Seems to me, ladies and gentlemen, this might be a good time for our morning break. So we're going to come back at 11.10. So ladies and gentlemen, during this recess, you're admonished not to talk or converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this trial. You must not read, watch, or listen to any report of or commentary on the trial or any person or entity connected with the trial by any medium of information, including without limitation, social media, text, tweets, newspapers, television, internet, radio, anything I've not stated specifically is, of course, also included. Do not visit the scene of the events mentioned during the trial or undertake any research, experimentation, or investigation. Do not do any posting or communications on social networking sites. Do not do any independent research, including but not limited to internet searches. Do not form or express any opinion on any subject connected to the trial. The case is fully and finally submitted to the time of jury deliberations. If, however, on the CAM side, if you want to, you can feel free to bring any of the treats out with you during your break. Thank you so much. All rise, jury excellent. Okay. Um, so, Council, is there anything you need? If not, I'm going to wish you a nice break. And we said 11:10. I just stayed a little bit longer in case there was something you needed right now. As we're going over our last review of the exhibit list, sure. we've, we've already sent it to opposing counsel, and so we're going to move those exhibits in, and then I think we're done. Okay, so you think you might be done for the day? Well, we're done. Yeah. I'm going to ask counsel. Okay, that's why I'm going one by one. So, counsel for plaintiff, that's set. And then if their plaintiff is going to rest, then counsel for defense. Your Honor, um, we do need to review the exhibits. I don't know if my team has had a chance to look at them. Sure. Um, we would have a motion outside the presence uh, after they rest. Won't take more than five minutes, and then um, we have some video depositions that we can play to get those out of the way. Okay, about how long? Just if you have a ballpark, I'm just yes, trying to Honor. figure out the lunch concept for Sorry. our ladies and gentlemen drink. Because I hate to send them out for lunch, come back for like five minutes or so, right? Without rushing you. If you have a ballpark, that'd be great. I do, Your Honor. Um, all of the videos, if we play them all, um, are just under uh, two hours and more like okay. an hour and 45 minutes if all of them are played today so regardless they're going to come back after lunch i just wanted to make sure we didn't have like you know a five minute time period when they're coming back after lunch yeah i we took a really late lunch break which wouldn't be fair so okay. yeah no that's all right okay sounds good thank you enjoy your break thank you so much for the record